to the State of the Jamstack at our second virtual Jamstack conference. Obviously, 2020 has been a really challenging year for all of us with pandemic, fires, hurricanes, turmoil, recession. And uh, once again, because of the pandemic, we've had to take the Jamstack conference virtual instead of celebrating it on location in San Francisco. So this is the second time that we are all together in a virtual space instead of in the real world. Uh, and on the plus side, this does mean that, that, that we can fit a lot more of us. And uh, I'm really excited to, to see all of you and to be here with you. Um, 2020, even if it's been rough, it hasn't stopped the Jamstack. Last time at, uh, at the previous Jamstack conference, we saw exciting projects like covidtracking.com um, use the Jamstack to really tackle like how do we build for a global scale uh, during a con pandemic with small localized teams. And uh, since then, we're now uh, running more than 465 sites on our COVID plan at Netlify, our nonprofit plan for, for companies uh, or for teams that are trying to tackle the global pandemic through research and knowledge sharing and so on. At the, at the same time, we uh, celebrated at Netlify Crossing, one million developers signed up to our platform just as a testament to how much traction this category and this, uh, this space we're in have right now. And we've seen uh, just the two frameworks, Gatsby and Next, grow to a place where we're seeing more than a million NPM downloads every single month. We also see a really vibrant ecosystem in the framework space with new frameworks like Scully or Toast, Nox, Hugo, Sap, or Gritsum, all seeing really uh, active development. Eleven C Toast is a fun one, like really it's trying to pave the way for non-JavaScript based JavaScript build tools, like it's uh, based on, on Rust and, and, and really interesting, but just showing that there's still so much experimentation and so much development happening in this whole category. And just in 2020, we've seen more than $100 million in venture funding uh, go to companies like Commercially and Cell, Fauna, and uh, ourselves at Netlify and so on. Um, and we know that there's even more funding rounds getting announced soon. Stay, stay tuned for some interesting announcement coming up in the next couple of days. Um, but this again just shows like this really strong interest in, in the Jamstack space and how vibrant the ecosystem is. And the Jamstack is really, as an architecture, much bigger than any single framework or any single vendor like, like ourselves. When we set out to build the, the Jamstack, uh, or when we coined the term Jamstack, uh, we never talked about it as just about like static sites or simple markdown-based blocks or something like that. It was always about a broader direction for how we develop for the web. It was always about Jamstack for web applications. The Jamstack is sort of right in the middle of a tremendous wave of innovation uh, that's expanding what the web is capable of. And that's really changing the developer experience and changing where processing happens uh, and how we deliver sites and applications. Uh, like, who would have thought? just a few years ago that the fastest growing IDE for developers, the fastest growing office suite and the fastest growing graphics program would all be delivered as web apps today. This is really remarkable and a sign of like how far we've come. Uh, web development has become software development. The Jamstack brings a lot of the principles and pra practices of robust software development like Git-based workflows, the idea of atomic deploys, building, linting code, and so on, to web developers. Um, so it's changing how the web is built, and it's also changing how the web is being delivered from going from a single origin where you have like your web server living in a specific data center to this idea of distributing your side application on edge nodes all over the world. But the core we talked about back when we coined the term Jamstack was really about this idea of reversing the flow. It was a term that came about through speaking to lots of different people in the ecosystem, from people that were working on site generators to people that were doing platforms as a service, or people that would later go on to launch some of the exciting frameworks we're seeing today, like Redwood. Um, and it was really about this idea of reversing the flow away from this central request response cycle. 
So if we dive back into sort of the traditional monolithic application, the way we structured our application and the way we built for the web was always like fundamentally really centered around this idea that a request would come in to a web server in some specific data center, it would talk to our application server, and then that application server would connect to typically a general purpose database, maybe a search engine, maybe different APIs and services in a resource oriented architecture. And we would have these different layers of compute and data, right? Like the web server would really be a very specialized compute layer, very focused on routing, redirect rules, proxying, things like that. And then we would have a general purpose compute layer at our application server that was sort of the center of this request response cycle. And if we look at like the typical, like this is just from Magnolia's documentation about how to run Magnolia in production, right? Like we see this whole like complex monolithic system built with the application server absolutely in the in the center of it. In a similar vein, this is just from uh, WordPress, like on, on a guide on how to run WordPress on, on AWS, right? We really get this sense of the request coming in, running through the load balancers, going to the application servers, the application servers really being like this monolithic compute layer in the center of everything contacting all the different services, search engines and so on, and then sending back a response. And this was just like a, a good diagram I, I, I found like of, of a typical like web application architecture and how we built these things, right? And I guess we, again, we have like in the center of the whole universe, this idea of the web application server that's connected to a general purpose database and then typically talks to different services, to search engines and uh, triggers background jobs and so on. But again, everything is oriented around this request response cycle that, that goes from the user through this app server layer. And with the Jamstack approach, what we thought back then was really like, we can reverse the flow. We can say like, instead of building everything on the fly and having that like centralized application server as the center of everything, we can detect when everything, anything changes in source code or in content, and then we can pre-build as much as possible um, in a build step and push it out to the edge layer, um, get it much closer to the user, um, and, um, and really like shortening the distance from the user to the pre-built front end. And then also having the user just talk directly to these different APIs and services. Like suddenly our search engine might just become a, a service like Algolia that's like globally distributed on its network in itself and that you talk to straight from the browser instead of going through that whole request response, response cycle that depends on our centralized application server. So we try to pre-build as much as we can and push it to the, to the edge and in these typical Jamstack diagrams, we just no longer have an application server. The edge has become like the first point of contact. And we've really decoupled all these different layers that before either lived within our application servers and our general purpose databases or behind them eh, to let the user just talk directly to them eh, as, as APIs. And a lot of these APIs, like, they're really rethinking in a way what, what it means to have general compute and general storage, right? Like before you would have this general compute layer and this general storage layer that might both do your search and your authentication and your subscriptions and storing users, storing orders, storing content, all, all in one monolithic application. Today, many of those functionalities have even spun out uh, to be independent companies, like Contentful for content, right? And again, this is really sort of a, a cobbled together specialized compute layer uh, and, and specialized data layer for your content. Off zero, right, is an example of uh, you can store your users there in a specialized database, right? Like it's not for, you don't have to do any data modeling, you just put users there and they have a format for that that's tied to a special purpose compute layer for authentication, sign-in, sign-ons, the uh, detection of fraudulent sign-ons and so on. Mentioned Algolia before, Shopify can be used in a headless mode. Uh, similarly, as your sort of specialized data store and compute layer for payments and orders and so on. 
and really if we think back to to the to the old model right like if any of you have tried building something like a subscription uh, and invoicing and billing model, this is just like a, 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 a database diagram of, of how to model that. And I can tell you like this, this is really hard and it's hard to get right. And you will have to go through lots of iterations, lots of bugs, lots of thinking of data structures and so on. And today you would probably be much better off by just adopting Stripe and saying like, they've done all the data modeling for you. They've done all the specialized uh, compute around triggering subscriptions, changing plans, sending invoices, around reporting and analytics and all of these things. And then what, what you have to do is just a very simple general compute layer that you can typically handle in something like a, a Netlify function or an AWS Lambda function or any, anything like that, that that allows you to take just small bits of, of general purpose compute and, and write code against these more special purpose services, right? Like, so this is just a little code snippet from, from, from a real world Netlify function that, that, that deals with, um, with, with Stripe's billing portal. Um, and if we look at this Jamstack architecture, of course, we still have general purpose compute and, and general purpose data, but we often see that it gets simpler, it gets smaller and easier to reason about. Each function we deploy only has the dependencies that are needed for that function to, to, to run and to interact with, with other services. And often we are even seeing the data layer for those functions become simpler, often more of a key value store when, when, when you're already delegating so much of the more complex data modeling to ready-made services. Um, and um, if, we, if we go to sort of the oral compute model on the Jamstack, we have this, we still have this specialized compute layer, just like the, we had it with the web server in the old architecture that will typically had, handle routing and uh, directly serving assets, um, simple forms of, of, of authentication. Then we have a general purpose compute layer in, in our build step. There we can do anything, but it's all decoupled completely from a re request response cycle and the flow is really reversed, right? Like we build it and then we push it out to the edge. But in the legacy approach, when we look at the application server, we also, we have these things that people do during the request response cycle, like authentication or personalization or routing, routing to authenticated services in a resource oriented architecture that, that we can't quite do with just the specialized compute in the web server. It's too complex to just fit into a set of redirect or rewrite rules. And it has to happen as part of this request response cycle. So how can we solve for that when we're working within a, a Jamstack approach where we've really fundamentally reversed this flow and we no longer depend on this traditional request response cycle? How can we bring that to the edge and closer to the user? So five years ago at Netlify, we built out a, a whole new infrastructure for the Jamstack. We, we saw back then that um, all the traditional edge networks at the time were really just content delivery networks that were made to sit in front of your origin, in front of your application server. And we needed an edge network that was really meant to replace your application server where you no longer think about that, where you just push to the edge and you have your assets ready for the user. Um, since then, over the last many years, of course, we've talked to so many customers uh, and even potential customers. And some do need that general purpose compute layer during the request response cycle for when they're doing maybe more advanced personalization, uh, when they're building e-commerce with, uh, with, where, where personalization can be really critical for conversions, or if they're doing more complex authentication patterns, uh, anything like that. Uh, and as we worked, on, on this at Netlify and talk to the whole ecosystem, partners in the framework space or service space and so on, we became increasingly aware that uh, we had to really rethink how the Jamstack was served at Netlify. So the result for us has been like thousands of hours later, a completely new super highway for the Jamstack. We've rebuilt our entire Edge software completely under the code name Traffic Mesh. And we've been building the next iteration of Netlify's Edge. And this is why we're now able to introduce Edge handlers. So 
In addition to pre-computed assets and declarative rules for routing, it adds the ability to run general purpose compute directly at the edge as part of the request response cycle. And we see this as really essential for handling these cases around personalization, authentication, routing to authenticated services. We've had examples of, of uh, retailers that wants to show a the closest shop to you when you access the homepage. Um, this again, something that you can't just do with, with a completely like a declarative rule. You need some logic in place. And with edge handlers, we'll allow you to write that logic. And again, just as with Netlify functions, we tend to see that, that this logic layer becomes simpler, easier to reason about. It's not about a big monolithic application handling these concerns in, in a full request response cycle. It's really about being able to write simply simple handlers that runs directly during the edge, typically in milliseconds. And it's really about shortening the distance from the user to authentication, to personalization, to authenticated proxying, or just general compute in that at the routing layer. The, the imagination of what you can do with this is, is something that we're really excited about exploring now that we are taking it into the world. Um, and if we think about compute in general as a part of the Netlify platform, we, we have these three varieties of general purpose compute for your application. There's like the, the special purpose compute like that's pre-computed, right? Like anything that you get directly from our edge network. There's the edge routing and edge compute that, um, that happens in, in milliseconds, right? Like um, this, is the, this is the layer where we're now introducing edge handlers for anything that you can run in a few milliseconds. You can push it directly to the edge and handle it there. And then of course you have the build layer where you can do long running general purpose compute processes to pre-build as much as possible of the whole experience up front. For a long time now, we've had Netlify functions uh, as, as, as this first layer for um, APIs, microservices, glue code, anything that you can run within a request response cycle in a few seconds. So ideal for building API endpoints that need to be close to the, close to the data or in, ideal for building this glue code between your different specialized services like Stripe or Contentful or any of these that just needs to tie together a few different components. But today, we're also introducing a fourth layer of general purpose compute that we call background functions. So this is really for running async processes. If you want to do batch processing, if you want to do scraping, if every time someone signs up for a subscription, you need to go through a series of steps to add them to different APIs and services, and you don't want that to happen within a, like a, a request response cycle, you can now delegate that to a background function that can run asynchronously for up to 15 minutes um, with full general purpose compute available. And everything, every one of these kinds of, of compute is managed just in one repository, one workflow. You have your site generator or your front end framework for, for doing all the pre-compute. This example, just like a simple 11 configuration file in your set. You have your Netlify Toml for doing all the declarative edge routing for all the special purpose compute at the, at the edge that you can write in a declarative format and, and easily ship together with your whole application. And now, if you participate in the early access of edge handlers, you can add a folder called edge handlers and simply write the edge functions for general purpose edge compute there. It'll get deployed together with the rest of the site. It works with deploy previews. It's a seamless part of the whole experience of working with Netlify. Same as with functions. You just add a functions folder and for example, add a subscribe gears for signing up for someone to, to a Stripe subscription. It's a simple serverless function. It'll get deployed with the rest of your site. You can also just add a function and append the name dash background. Just by doing this, we'll know that it's a background function. Any invocation will be asynchronous, it'll run in the background, and we'll allow it to run for up to 15 minutes. Very powerful primitive for, for building for the web. So today we're really presenting a very complete set of primitives to take the Jamstack to the next level and make developers' lives even easier. And we're doing that 
because we are all really big believers in the web. And we want a strong, independent web to deliver incredible experience to, to the end users. And we are extremely exciting, excited to work together with framework authors, with the whole ecosystem and with web developers to make the web an even better place and an even stronger place to publish and create. Um, thank you, everybody. I'm extremely excited about today's conference, uh, all the presentations. I hope you'll all enjoy the day and have a great event. Thank you.